Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This week, your show, we're talking about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Mob Psycho 100, Season 1, Episode 10. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. First and foremost, let's start off with Risu's group, where they end up coming across the brother that was kidnapped last episode. So I was like, okay. So I had this theory. I was like, I'm wondering, is that going to be for real? I was like 70% sure it was real, but there was like a small part of my brain. that's like, could it be a fake out? But it's like, no, seems to be legit. He's just chilling with the lackeys who are all people who haven't awakened, which I think that's such an interesting thing. Cause like the older member there, he was like, yo, if you haven't awakened, you most likely never will. It's like, you have to awaken at first. And if you don't, you don't. So I thought that was so fascinating because, um, Apparently, home dude was like, oh, I've been here for like 20 years, which I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting this organization to be that old. Hell, it might even be older than that. He might be like a, the oldest lackey here, but the fact of the matter is the organization might even be older than that. But even 20 years, I wasn't expecting it to have been around that long. I guess in my head, I almost expected it to be like a newer-ish organization. Like I said, who knows how long it's been around. But I love that Risu and them, just while they were talking and stuff, just snuck in, grabbed the brother and bounced, but got caught. But he's the one that's like, no, 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 let them go. And it's like, well, why would we do that? Because he's like, no, it isn't a one versus ten when it comes to a normal person versus a psychically powered person. It's more like zero to ten. We have no means of defeating them. Which, yeah, true be told is they weren't going to be able to match up to Risu. But he comes at it from the perspective of, at the end of the day, the, this organization, Claw, is going to own everything and run the world. All we have to do is, you know, stay, choose to be on their side, and th this this world will be, you know, we as their lackeys will be rewarded for our loyalty. And other men are kind of like, yeah, you're so smart. It's like, yeah, work harder, work smarter, not harder type of situation, right? Because it's like, right, they think it's kind of a foregone conclusion that this revolution is going to happen and Claw is going to come out on top. Ultimately, they end up running into show, which at first I was like, because I was curious. I completely forgot until like the end of the episode that it clicked in my head. I remembered that conversation from the beginning of the episode that those lackeys are talking about like, oh, there is one person who survived those experiments. Most people end up with severe brain damage or die. But there is a kid who was sent over from HQ who survived. And it didn't even correlate in my head because I kind of forgot about that when show showed up. But it seems like he's that one. So if he was, he's not because he doesn't have a scar, so that made Risu think like, okay, maybe there's a shot I have at this. But he also isn't as afraid because it's like, well, I know someone so much more times powerful than you, that being Mob. And so it's interesting that... I wonder what's his deal. He must be like a prodigy or really, really good for him to be here. So I'm assuming he outclasses everyone here, even the guy that's kind of the boss of the seventh uh, division. Like even he might not, what, compare to, I'm mean, assuming he has higher authority than the boss of the seventh division since like HQ specifically sent him over. So he must be an even higher echelon, um, higher than everyone else here or something. So... But yeah, everyone's dealing with their respective uh, situations. We had Dimple uh, going up against well, some like you know some lackeys, some minions. Easily took them down. Even though he's not that powerful, they can't really do much. And I love after beating them up, it's like asking that one guy about that experiment room, and it's like, yeah, that's where they put. Um, those who can awaken through torture because it's like through pain you can awaken. It's like, yeah, that is true. But any of those lackeys, all they have is enough power to paralyze a person. Like it's something that could work against a normal person, sure, but someone that's more psychically inclined, even someone like him who is a evil spirit, it's not going to be enough. Even in his weakened state, he was still strong enough to fend off all of them. And I actually felt good for Dimple because I'm like, oh man, this is your one victory. Every other fight you've ever been in in this series so far, you've had an L. Whether it was against Mob, whether it was against uh, Tsuruki, or it was even your attempts to possess Risu weren't like, you know, you've had L after L and this was your one victory. But that was short-lived because the guy who basically has control over evil spirits showed up. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of like the most... I don't want to say useless, but like the lower tier fighters of the groups because eventually Dimple realized like, oh, you actually, your monsters always come back to you. It's because 
Uh, he's kind of got, like, once again, my brain always makes correlations and connections. Him summoning spirits and being able to control, well, not summoning spirits, but controlling them makes me think of, um, God, there's, there's home dude from, um, I always struggle with his name. He's from one of the ten great families in Tower of God. Like, I mean, there's like a, oh, like, there's a whole family dedicated to, like, controlling monsters, but he's, like, the head of the ten great families, the dude that can control monsters. Kind of reminds me of that. It also makes me think of, um, V from Devil May Cry 5 uh, with his ability. So, just, that was what immediately came to my mind, but then I thought about the Tower of God correlation as well. But either way. But it's like, yeah, you're defenseless without your monsters. That's why they always come back towards you. So I love Dimple pretending like he's got this plan. The body falls over. Dimple's like, I'll challenge and beat you later and bounces. I was like, okay. But then it turns out that was a trick as he sneaks back into the body and prepares to attack the guy. But the guy's got more monsters, um, evil spirits uh, bound. And he's like, oh, he's got like a utility belt of it. So I was like, yeah, interesting. So it, it's even more so like the Tower of God comparison that I was just making. Uh, but other than that, we also had Taruki going up against, uh, Pyrokinesis guy. I mean, after he was kind of like beating up those lackeys and he's just like, right, he took, uh, lessons from the, the gang at his school at, uh, Black Vinegar. And he's like, oh, I kind of had to pretend to be like those guys. But I guess it's like, I mean, it, it was somewhat in his personality already, but it was kind of like that assertiveness of like, oh, you kind of got to dominate someone and, you know, but he like, he kind of had to slip back into a little bit of who he was, but he had to more so come at it from the angle of Black Vader Grove. You got to stomp people down and kind of break their spirit to get the information you want. So he found out that Risu and them are like managed to escape. And I love that last guy's like, oh, you think you're going to get away with this? And he lights up his finger with his power kinesis. He's like, oh, I finally did that. And he gets slammed into the wall. But then... Uh, Taruki has to go up against an actual pyrokinetic, one of the scars, and the guy's got the entire room consumed in fire, and, um, it's a really interesting way of the fight, because he's like, right, he basically forces, um, Taruki's hands, it's like, right, if I get close enough to you and, like, put up the barrier, you, you're kind of in insulated with all that heat, so you're screwed, so you can keep up the barrier, or you can fight me, but the longer you're keeping it up, the more you're going to burn, but if you, like, it's a loose-loose situation, so in that moment, Taruki does the easy thing, instead, he wraps a barrier around, um, the opponent, and the guy ends up burning himself, I was like, oh, that's, morbid especially when he comes out like literally burnt like a match You're like jesus that is brutal but then you know sword guy shows up as well as one of the other scars and knocks turuki out it would i mean who knows how turuki would have really fared if it was one-on-one -on -one, but he kind of got caught off guard so and then we had the whole situation with mob first he deals with the little girl uh, from the scars like her group is like she has the power of like summoning a whole bunch of dolls i wonder can she not like i wonder it's supposed to be like an immortal army so i'm curious are those the only ones she had made and does she have to make them or how does that work because after they got broken you know she was almost like oh and like broke down and cried and crawl uh, cry, uh cried to the uh other scar member and i'm like I wonder, like, does she have to focus and rebuild them? Or are they beyond repair? Does she have to, like, make them one at a time with her powers? Like, it might be a, like, time-consuming thing of, like, she doesn't have it. She can have an unlimited army, sure, but it takes time to rebuild them. Or maybe what Mob did made them beyond repair. I, I don't know. Because it looked like that room he was in, it looked like you could see spares in the background. But m maybe I'm just mistaken. Uh, once again, making another anime comparison. Kind of reminds me of Naruto, her power, like, especially the dolls. I thinking of, it makes me think of, a. I can't remember his name. It's Gara's brother. There's, what was her name? Grandma Chio. I believe that was it, uh, from Shippuden. She was, like, one of the leaders of the Sand Village. As well as the guy that they fight in Shippuden. That's from the Akatsuki, uh, who uses dolls. It kind of, uh, reminds me of just all the doll play in that regard. Oh, you know, with trails in, uh, on my mind, obviously it reminds me of uh, a certain person who, the new third Anguis, without spoiling anything if you've never played any trails games, the current third Anguis, uh, at least what I, I think she, this person is still the third Anguis, but they use dolls, so it just kind of reminded me of that too. Um, but yeah, quickly dispatches a dam, she shows up and fights Mob because it's like, okay, like, 
Because he was like, am I going to have to find an old lady too? And she's like, old lady. And basically she can like add that key to her body and it increases her punches and blows. And she's beating up mob. And he's able to kind of push back a little bit, but she's not giving him enough time to focus on his telekinesis. But partway through it, he starts crying and she's like, oh, does it hurt that much? But then he's like, do I really have to fight a woman? Because he's like, the person, someone taught me that, like, if you hit or fight a woman, it, it makes you the biggest loser in the world. Which she's kind of, you know, respect of a warrior. She's like, hey, like, that's that's actually sweet. That's very gentlemanly of you, but it's also very disrespectful. It's like, I want to fight you fair and square. So she even, you know, she has her honor as a fighter. It's like, no, I'm going to fight you fair and square. So treat me like I would any other opponent, which I thought was interesting because I was like, huh. I was like, it was, I didn't even think about it. It didn't even cross my mind to think like, ah. Oh, like, uh, Mob hasn't gone up against a female up until this point in time. So I was like, oh, interesting. Which you, you immediately go like, oh, maybe Regan, yes, despite how duplicit is and how much of a con artist he is. I was like, maybe he has some, he still has good principles that Mob is kind of lived by, you know, for the most part. You know, it's just like, yeah, not using your powers willy-nilly against people, like not hitting a woman, you know. Um, yeah. So you're like, but not let's it with someone else. You'd assume it's supposed to be Regan. I, I don't remember if he said his master or not. He might have just said someone did because I was like, it could be his dad, but I assumed he was talking about Regan. You'd, most advice he like follows is based around stuff Regan told him. So, so once again, he kind of showed him like, oh, maybe there's something more to that scumbag. We'll talk about that a little bit. But um, despite all that, uh, yeah. We didn't get to see it, but it seems Mob ended up easily dispatching her. The other dude got sent to him, the one that can shape his, change his face. We didn't even get to see what he could do because Mob immediately washed him. And then finally he comes across Risu, who got beaten up apparently from the fight show. Then the guy who is bat, uh, who's able to brainwash and hypnos hypnotize people shows up. And he tries to do it to Mob. It's like, oh, I'm going to show you something. And he shows Mob like the memory of like that day that it's kind of haunted mob he sees it and obviously it's kind of conflating with now and all he sees in his head is like oh my god my brother's dead and i thought it was so interesting because like the numbers start changing i was like oh i was like you getting him agitated and stressing him out is actually going to be worse then tickers start going up more and more but then it start fluctuating like between like what 96 or 96 like it kept flipping back and forth between a lower number and a higher number until he finally like hit 100 percent and was able to like like basically reverb like that guy's power against him and it was just like i guess it still took its toll on mob because he doesn't get like like passes out like that typically when he goes to 100 percent. but i guess it's like enough of the damage was done to him psychologically that it was like the reverb like he backlashed it towards the guy and fried his brain but he still suffered the damage regardless and then show shows up being like oh good i wanted to use that uh risu as bait looks like i was right to so now, Taruki's like, whoa, like, uh, Kageyama got defeated because he was like, yo, I know how powerful he is. Once again, the thing that went off against you has still not come out yet. Granted, also, like, Mob didn't go, like, you know, he still, it wasn't like a full-blown fight, so he still hadn't really cut loose on his natural state. But also, Taruki's thinking about the time when they fought and, like, that thing came out. Once again, we saw the percentage at the time. It's a question mark because we don't know what fully, fully triggers that. You know, even when he goes 100%, it doesn't necessarily mean that comes out, you know. But even um, the boss of the uh, seventh division is like, yeah, what are we going to do when the actual boss shows up? He's not going to be too happy about the fact is seven of the 11. Uh, scars have been defeated kind of you know by like two people basically that being um tarada i mean that being um turuki and uh mob mostly mob but still and so as before the kids are able to escape in kind of a post credits we see that they're stopped because someone shows up and people are bowing and they're like, oh, this aura, it's got to be the leader of uh, the Claw organization as a whole. But then when you get a look at his face, I was like, is that fucking Regan? Because it sure as shit looks like him. So I'm like, interesting. I figured there, I was like, there's no way they're just going to, it's like, is Regan just going to be the con owners? Or are we going to find out that like there's more to him? I thought there might be. He was, you know. But I don't, I don't know. And basically with the voiceover from the end of the episode for like, you know, previewing the next episode, I'm like, 
is like it did Regan come here and he's like faking it till he makes it pretending to be the leader I mean how would he know where they are in the first place so it's like interesting but it also makes sense like if Regan maybe Regan wasn't always powerful maybe he was like you know maybe he was someone without powers until he experimented on himself and became like he knows what it's like to feel powerless and so he wanted to give power to people i mean that could also be why he took such an interest in mob but i mean if he was part of call like why wouldn't he grab up mob sooner i mean mob's been working for him for a while has he just been trying to i guess maybe it's a thing of he built this organization and maybe he doesn't like it you know uh, I'm going to make another example. It's like, maybe it's like Ouroboros in the Trails games where it's like the Enforcers and to some extent the Anguises have a lot of freedom to do whatever they want to. And maybe he kind of pulled away from the organization that he potentially started or maybe maybe he's one of the founders of it. And maybe he took an interest in Mob and maybe that's why he doesn't have any s spiritual powers. Maybe he did have uh, psychic powers at one point in time but lost him because of something a la like... I'm making all the anime examples today, sorry. Like, kind of a Bleach situation. It's been a while with Bleach, but if I remember correctly, because, spoilers, Ichigo's dad is a Shinigami. Had, has Shinigami powers, and I was like, I think he lost them at one point in time. I guess another example would be, like, using Ichigo himself after, like, after the Aizen fight, he ended up losing his powers until he eventually got them back. You know, so, maybe, or, or Rukia, whichever example you want to use to all of that, so... Not unless that's Regan's circumstances. Maybe it's not Regan at all, but I'm like that from the tiny bit we saw we saw like a third of his face. I'm like, it looked like it was Regan. Plus that voiceover made it seem like it's confirming that it's him. But I don't know. I'm interested to see what that's all about. I mean, obviously there's only what two episodes left this season, because yeah, there's only twelve episodes in the first season. So I'm like, that's gonna be interesting. I think that's kind of a neat reveal. I figured there might be more to Regan later on, but never like potentially him being a villain. So I'm curious to find out what that's all about like are we going to set up the fact is regan might be like the main main antagonist of the series in that regard because another aspect i was thinking of what the whole point was like this whole thing is about awakening the powers and people and giving powers to people who didn't have them like i said that goes back to maybe regan didn't have powers and then he gave himself powers or something there's so many different ways that could go if it is what it is so i'm excited to see where the next episode ultimately ends up taking us going forward with all of this but really that's all i want to talk about to the next time we meet be happy be safe live life to the fullest and enjoy it good day and good bye